My name is John Lobel. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute. I blog at creativitydiscourse.com. I review movies at cinemadiscourse.com. <clears throat> you can reach me at John Lobel at Mac, M A C dot com. And this lecture is from First Year Architectural History Addressing the Italian Baroque. So, today we're talking about um, the Italian Baroque and a <clears throat> huge amount to say about that. We're going to just talk about two architects, so that's going to greatly simplify it. So we start with the observation that the term Baroque comes from several uh, Roman European Romance languages for a rough or imperfect pearl. So those perfectly round pearls are uh, the exception and very hard to find. Most pearls are more. Now I'm going to begin with some slides with just words, a few ideas to go over here. So um, the word Baroque, as we've been learning through the semester, <clears throat> these names get applied by art historians later. People at the time didn't say, oh, wow, <laughs> cool, we're in the Baroque era. Um, and they probably thought of themselves as in the Renaissance. So it's a word invented later. And it was, uh, as with the term Gothic, it was meant as a pejorative. It was meant as a put down. Uh, eccentric redundancy and noisy abundant details. So uh, we kind of have this explosion of details and fussiness compared to the Renaissance. And a lot of uh, a lot of contemporaries even were not happy about that, and the um, word gets rehabilitated by Heinrich Wolfram, the historian, and it's been in common usage since the 1920s. So there's a book that your faculty all have called Bannister Fletcher, or a, a history of architecture and historical uh, method, and has great illustrations. It's totally useless to read, um, although it's been updated. It was written in the 1890s. So he doesn't even have the, the, the term Baroque. And some of the architect, the, the key architect we're talking about today, um, uh, Borromini, is mentioned you know, in one sentence in the book and there are no illustrations. So you can see how these, what's important, uh, moves around over time. Now. Uh, we can see the Baroque either as its own distinct period or as a continuation of the Renaissance. And either argument is, is acceptable. And let's look at a differentiation. So with the Renaissance, we have classical precedents. They're looking at Rome, uh, particularly the Pantheon. With the Baroque, we have classical precedents, but from different periods. We're looking at other Roman buildings, as we'll see in a minute. And in a way, you know, somewhat oversimplified, we're going to say the Renaissance was static, the Baroque dynamic, <clears throat> the Renaissance rational, the Baroque emotional, and then sort of as symbolic of this uh, rational, uh, static or dynamic quality, the circle is important in the Baroque, in the Renaissance. We see the circular dome. We start seeing ellipses and even elliptical domes in the Baroque. And the ellipses we'll see in a moment is dynamic as opposed to the static circle. So the Baroque can be seen as a distinct style or as the final phase of the Renaissance. And then we're going to see Rococo <laughs> in a couple of weeks. And that can be seen as its own distinct style or the final phase of the Baroque. Uh, we start with the Counter-Reformation. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through these because we're going to see them in a minute. But uh, we have the Counter-Reformation of Luther, absolutism on the part of the popes and the French kings, uh, the growth of uh, science and philosophy, and the notion of stylistic dynamics. So let's see what those are. So the Reformation um, in uh, 1517, Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the door of the local church. 
demanding that the Catholic Church clean up corruption. And the most, and to those who were serious, uh, the most annoying corruption was the selling of indulgences. You say, look, I'm going to go out and I'm going to murder my neighbor and uh, have sex with his wife. Um, that would get you in hell, but I'll, I'll, I'll pay a chunk of money to the church and it'll be okay. Um, so that was an indulgence. And kings would always buy indulgences before going off to war. What's, where's that at? <laughs> So Martin Luther is objecting to these kinds of things. And what he meant to be an attempt to reform the church uh, led to the northern, uh, in general, the northern European countries breaking away from the Catholic Church and forming various Protestant sects. So Protestantism is not one alternative church, but uh, several. Now, the church responds. And that's called the Counter-Reformation. So the period we're looking at is the Counter-Reformation. And it's a period where the church asserts doctrine. says, look, what the Pope and the church say is true is true. No discussion. There are new re religious orders, such as the Jesuits, that are highly loyal to the uh, Pope and the church. And... Um, there is an exuberant rebuilding of Rome to generate an enthusiasm, an emotional enthusiasm for the church. So there's an emotional quality to the arts to generate a, 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 an emotional religious ecstaticness in support of the church. Now, absolutism is... is um, typically associated with French kings. We'll see the French Baroque in a couple of weeks, but we can also associate it with this notion of the absolute authority of the Pope. So absolutism becomes important. Interestingly, at just the same time that we're having the beginnings of the scientific revolution. So we have these two threads running together. <clears throat> So scientific revolution, and obviously this is a long and gradual thing, but just to be a little bit arbitrary, we can date it at uh, 1543. Two things happen. Copernicus uh, publishes his, um, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, his proposal that the sun and not the earth is the center of the solar system. And the same year, Vesalius publishes his book on anatomy. Now, Renaissance artists have been strong on anatomy for some time, but this really renders it into a very scientific point of view with the great detailed accuracy of the study of the human body on the part of Vesalius. Uh, this issue of precedence, we see here um, the Roman Pantheon, and we see its influence on the Renaissance in many buildings, including uh, Palladio's Villa Rotunda, but there are other Roman buildings that are nowhere near as crisply, clearly rational that start breaking all the rules. Now, this is in Petra in Jordan, unknown to the artists of the day. We'll talk about that, but other examples were. But we're going to see this showing up in the Baroque uh, material. This is, for example, a broken pediment. So the pediment is broken. Then there's a little temple dropped into the middle of the pediment. I mean, this is just not following the rules. Now, um, we can use the, I and mean, we're referring to Michelangelo, we can use the term proto-Baroque. So look at the back of St. Peter's Cathedral. This is shows us Michelangelo's intention. The front gets added on to later. has nothing to do with his designs. But look at how incredibly richly, powerfully sculptural this is. Look at the ins and outs, the dynamic quality of it. This is almost hardly Renaissance. This is, um, if it was built during the Baroque period, we'd say it's Baroque. But since it's quite some time before, uh, we might even say uh, Michelangelo has proto-Baroque tendencies, this rich, dynamic, sculptural quality that we also see in his uh, Laurentian Library stairs that we refer to as Manorus. But look at the use of the oval. Look, it looks like lava spilling down into this, into this room. So this rich, dynamic 
and we'll use the term emotional quality, is predictive of the um, Baroque. Here it, uh, is, just, this is a stage set design from the Baroque period, but uh, look at this, look at the one on the left, and this is a very typical single vanishing point perspective. Now we see this all over the Renaissance. Now the Renaissance had uh, two vanishing points as well, but look at the simplicity and clarity of this, and now look at how dynamic and complex and rich it becomes when you start playing around with it. So even perspective following the rules can become uh, rich and complex. Scientific revolutions. This is a Copernic Copernicus's manuscript. Now Copernicus moved the Earth out of the center of the solar system, put the Sun there. He was right on that. But he kept the orbits of the planets as circles, and so did Galileo, and they were totally wrong on that. And Galileo should have known better because he had um, uh, the material describing that they um, uh, were in fact ellipses. So, <laughs> um, Kepler, had worked for Taco Brehi, an astronomer, got all his data. When Taco Brehi died, Kepler had the most detailed um, astronomical observations available. And with that, he was able to figure out that the planets move in ellipses, not circles around the sun. Now, this is a comet, but it so gives us an exaggeration. But it's the same thing for the orbit of the Earth and the other planets. So the sun is one of two foci, focuses, for uh, the ellipse. And this is how you make an ellipse. Uh, you, you, at your two foci, you put in push pins, you put a string here, and you put your pencil in there, and you'll make an ellipse. So it's elliptical, it's not circle circular, but more importantly, it is dynamic. The planets move it at a constant speed around the sun in the model of Copernicus and Galileo. In um, uh, in thank you, in Kepler's model, they're dynamic. So area swept equals time, meaning as the planet comes around, it picks up speed. It goes slowly, slowly, then swoosh, picks up speed and whips around the sun and then slows down as it goes out. So it's dynamic. It's changing speed. This is revolutionary because the planets moved at a constant speed because they were embedded in crystalline spheres that were heavenly objects, were perfect, and the evidence of their perfectness was the fact that they move with perfect uniformity. So uh, there's the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. The heavenly realm is perfect. The earthly realm is corrupt and circumstantial. Suddenly, that difference is disappearing, and the heavenly realm is taking on earthly quality. It's just same, but far away, and uh, which is what Isaac Newton finally pulls together. Finally, here we have a portrait of a young woman on the left by Leonardo, and not much going on behind the eyes. Uh, there's not a strong development of an emotional interior on the part of the Renaissance artists. On the right is a self-portrait during the Baroque period by a northern artist, Rembrandt, and he did numerous self-portraits, and as he got older, you see embedded into his the features of his face the sorrows of his life. He had a wonderful life. He was the most important artist of his day, but his wife died. He became bankrupt. His art collections were auctioned off. Eventually, he was banned by his guild from even selling paint paintings. So uh, you see those richnesses of the experiences of his life with the joys and sorrows embedded into his face, and which is revealing a 
of an inner emotional psychology. <laughs> so the idea of an inner emotional psychology is a Baroque invention. And in fact, the Baroque investigates emotion. Emotions become a science. They categorize them, investigate them. It's a rich part of the Baroque. These are diagrams. They become associated with colors and uh, et cetera. And so just to sort of solidify these ideas about the Baroque, we'll look quickly at a few paintings by Caravaggio, the most important Baroque painter. So this is the, uh, let's see, St. Paul having an epileptic fit, which became was a revelation. So it's a religious revelation. Uh, he is hurled off his horse. He's thrashing around. He's in danger of the horse stomping on him. His arms are reaching up to pull us into the action of the painting. So in dynamic action and engagement with the audience becomes a key feature of the Baroque. Here's the supper at Emmaus. It's three days after Christ had been entombed and he comes back. Maybe. Uh, to several of the disciples. S for some reason, they don't recognize him right away. Uh, and so here's one of the disciples lurching out of his chair. Oh my God, it's him. Here's another one of the disciples reaching out to us, pulling us in and pointing at the Savior. So this emotional moment, shockingly emotional moment, and the dynamic quality of pulling us into the action. There's an eroticism in the Baroque. This is uh, Cupid, Venus's son, troublemaking uh, god of love. We can see the contrast between the Renaissance and the Baroque in these two paintings. On the left is Fra Angelico Annunciation. So here we have the angel Gabriel coming to Mary to tell her that she's pregnant with the child of God and no reaction. Everybody's calm, calm and cool. Here we have a Baroque painting, typical ceiling painting of the Ascension of Mary. And here it's dynamic and filled with action and clouds and hurtling figures and emotional and so perfect contrast between the Baroque and the Renaissance. Okay, so one of the things we should be aware of is that these artistic movements that we look at in this course in architecture, uh, pretty typically you find strong parallels of what's going on at the same time in painting, music, etc. Certainly in painting, because very often the architect is also a painter. And um, so they're all, it, it's an integrated thing. And here we see that what we're talking about in terms of the dynamic emotional qualities of the Baroque exist in music as well. Now we're going to look at just two architects. There are many more, but we're going to focus on these two. And first is Bernini. Unfortunately, we got lots of Bs, um, you know, Bramante and... Brunelleschi and Bernini and the next one as well. But um, so Bernini sort of saw himself as the Michelangelo of his day. He was also a Renaissance man, sculptor, painter, architect. He was also a musician, composer, um, a playwright, etc. And even parallels Michelangelo in uh, working later on St. Peter's and earlier doing a sculpture of David. Now, there's something very deceptive about this slide, other than an instructor. Does anyone know who, what's deceptive about this slide? This is five foot six tall. This is 17 feet tall. <laughs> so you put them next to each other, they won't look like this slide. But we're just sort of looking at the action here. Michelangelo's David is static. It is he, before the encounter with Goliath. He is contemplating what's coming up. He is in a contemplative, static mood and mode, standing still. Um, Bernini's David is in the midst of the action. He's actually swinging the sling 
uh, that's going to hurl the stone. And it engages the space beyond it, draws us into it. If you can triangulate between where his eyes are looking and where the stone's going to go, you can locate out from the sculptor the exact center of Goliath's forehead where he's going to be hit. So it engages the space beyond it, which is what's going to be very important about Baroque architecture. And here we see the uh, intense but contempt com contemplative face of Michelangelo's David, and here the um, pursed lips uh, and intensity in the middle of the action on the part of Bernini's. Now, this is not really pertinent to our general theme, but as architects, we want to look at this sculpture. Because as architects, we are supposed to appreciate materials. Concrete works best in compression. Concrete should be massive, squat, work in compression. Steel is can be light and thin and works in tension. So how we use materials is a response to their inner nature. Marble is fragile. It's not a very strong stone. It carves very well, and it looks beautiful, so it's a favorite of sculptors, but it's very fragile. You do not make thin things in marble, and in fact, usually have a tree growing up around your character's legs just to give it a sufficient reinforcing because you can't stand on these spindly thin legs. And certainly, you cannot make leaves out of marble, so Bernini does, just to show this... Uh, kind of exuberant um, um, uh, facility that he has with the materials. Now this is another Bernini sculptor and uh, central to our theme of eroticism, religiosity, uh, a lot of our themes. So this is Saint Teresa, a uh, wonderful character. If you're uh, a Buddhist like I am, you would appreciate her uh, St. Teresa's interior castle, which is a description of a series of concentric uh, palaces, one inside another. Where have we heard that before? What did I just describe? A mandala. <laughs> and uh, at the center of... Um, uh, a Buddhist mandala is a Buddhist deity at the center of hers is Christ. Anyway, it's a beautiful book. She was a very important figure, um, had intense ecstatic religious experiences and was a consummate politician and, a, and always in touch with her confessor to make sure she would never be accused of heresy because the Inquisition is at work at this time and she's able to negotiate that. <clears throat> this is a, a dream that she describes um, she describes how an angel pierced her heart with a flaming golden arrow. And she writes, the pain was so great that I screamed aloud, but at the same time, I felt such infinite sweetness that I wished the pain to last forever. There's another name for that. It's called an orgasm. Uh, but it is the church is very conscious of this, to use um, erotic ecstasy as um, conflated with religious ecstasy. And this ecstatic experience is very importantly being promoted by the church as part of its counter-reformation. We'll give you the experience. Those other guys are dry and dull, those Protestants. Um, and we see the richness of the robes, which is a, a Renaissance Baroque uh, notion, flowing robes of the angel. But we look here, and here it's the sculpture is set under gilded bronze rays from a sun and then right over here is a theatrical box uh, with the Coronaro family uh, witness who had put up the money for the chapel witnessing this act so and sort of standing for us as an audience witnessing it. So engagement with the audience, engagement with the pedestrian on the street in the case of architecture is an important part of the Baroque. Now, beginning in 1585, the papacy uh, seeks to reassert the grandeur of Rome, to recapture the uh, 
great Rome of the Roman period and to assert it as the capital of Christendom. And we're going to have a whole lecture about this um, in a few weeks, but a series of uh, key monuments are connected. Pope Sixtus V makes a map showing um, paths or eventually boulevards connecting the key monuments that, among other things, <coughs> um, pilgrims would be going from one to another during a pilgrimage to Rome. And this becomes the Baroque boulevards of Rome, and we're going to see similar Baroque boulevards develop in Paris. Now, focusing in on St. Peter's, here is, uh, well, let's, here is Michelangelo's uh, plan. Here is um, Moderno uh, putting on the extension. Here going back is Bramante's, and here is the original old St. Peter's. And here we see them overlaid historically. And here's our original Roman circus in the area. Now, <clears throat> the artists like the central or Greek cross plan, the church uh, disliked it for several reasons. Uh, they wanted the, uh, the key reason is theologically, besides the fact they needed more space, is that whoever's under the dome has access to God. And so in a central plan, you, this is the only space you're going to be under the dome, you're going to have access to God. In Catholicism, access to God comes through the institution of the church and the clergy, and then you get it through them. So God to them, and then them to you. And so in terms of theology, the Latin cross plan is uh, more suited to their idea. Now, um, the church wanted... The new St. Peter's, which is originally ending here and then gets its nave extended, to encompass all of the original, uh, including its courtyard, and now wants a courtyard in the front to um, cover that land, be a gathering place for pilgrims, but then most importantly, symbolically engage the faithful. So reaching out and engaging exactly what we saw in those Caravaggio paintings. So here's Moderno's facade. And then here is Bernini's colonnade. So arms reaching out and then embracing. And you can, you can tell it's an older slide because they used to allow buses to park here. <laughs> it finally occurred to them that uh, uh, that's not the right idea. Now, this is extremely dynamic piece of architecture. I mean, we could go on analyzing the brilliance of this uh, quite a bit. First of all, notice that uh, it's a reverse false perspective. So these arms here, instead of reaching, you would think, well, they should reach outward like this, but instead they go inward and um, create a foreshortening rather than lengthening the appearance of this distance, and so creating a tension between what you would anticipate and what is actually there. And then uh, it emphasizes this axis, but the axis of the ellipse is going this way. So it's contrary, again, to the anticipation. So you get this tension between the implied axis of the whole complex and the actual axis of the um, ellipse. And as um, Anthony pointed out two weeks ago, the was it Anthony or Ed? Who made the point about Mussolini removing this? Great, thanks. So um, this then extends as an axis beyond, which uh, perhaps the original intention was to have it more closed off. Thanks. <laughs> now, 
In addition, with all of this exuberance, all of this energy, Bernini does something else, which he uses the Tuscan order. Remember, the Tuscan order is the Roman sort of equivalent of the Greek uh, Doric, except it has a base. But it's plain. It does not have that exuberant uh, celebratory Corinthian capital. So these massive, huge columns. Here's some people giving us the scale. Uh, and all this dynamic exuberance, then playing against that is the calmness of the actual order chosen. The other key work of architecture by Bernini we'll look at is the tabernacle or baldacchino of St. Peter's. So here we are under the dome of St. Peter's, and we now need the tabernacle. Um, the space is huge, so we have a scale problem. How do we make something big enough to uh, engage that and at the same time not overpower or diminish the space? And so it's done rather the scale of the tabernacle is established rather than with size with energy. And so it uses what's called a Solomaic order. Now, there's no such thing. Uh, these are supposed to be the columns used in the Temple of Solomon. No one has any idea what kind of columns were used there. But you have to have a historic precedent. You couldn't make stuff up. So they said, oh, this is a Solomaic order. But he has these corkscrew twisting columns uh, giving a dynamic energy to the complex, increasing its scale without increasing its size, which would have interfered with the space of the um, uh, interior of St. Peter's. Okay, our other architect is Boromini. Now, Boromini uh, had a rather tragic life. He was a, a recluse, not good with people, and didn't get the big commissions, <clears throat> and uh, felt that he was a far superior architect to Bernini, and was bitter that he didn't get the commissions that Bernini got, and ended up committing suicide. And we'll look just briefly at two buildings. First is San Ivo. So um, here is this tiny little church in a courtyard, the back of a courtyard. And here we see this issue of engagement with the pedestrian through the countess interplay of convex and concave. So we'll see this more in the next project, but look at, um, we're drawn in to this concave at the entrance. Uh, the drum of the dome bulges out, it's convex, and then this little Roman temple on top goes in again, it's concave, and then the spiral on type goes out again, it's convex. So this ceaseless play of concave and convex dynamizing uh, the exterior and engaging the viewer or pedestrian. And we're most interested here in the rich geometry of the dome. There's the um, a little Roman temple on top and then the spiral. And so here we see this uh, adopted from Roman temples. This is not made up, having this convexity here in the, um, in the molding of our temple is not. It's against the rules if you're looking at the Pantheon. It's not against the rules if you look at other Roman precedents. This is it a temple of Venus? 
And here's our dome. Now, we see this as rather fussy, but at the time it was experienced as quite a strong continuity of the form from the um, drum up into the dome. And we see here um, what initially looks like rather arbitrary shapes, just curves all over the place, in fact, is arrived at, sorry, going the wrong way, through a very powerful geometric analysis. So remember when we were listening to that lecture on the Baroque music, it said that there is this exuberant emotionality built on iron-clad rules. So if you look at Bach's music, it is richly complex, but built, layered up on a series of very rigid, rigorous uh, subcomponents. So we get this rich, seemingly maybe even arbitrary dome by we lay down a triangle, then we get a triangle going the other way. So we have our two intersecting triangles, uh, Jewish star. Then every other point of the triangle becomes a part of a circle bulging out, and every other point of the triangle is nipped off by a part of a circle bulging in. So very rigorous geometric rules generating this um, seemingly complex and almost arbi seemingly arbitrary form. Our last example is San Carlo or the Quatre Fontaine. Now the Quatre Fontaine four fountains refers to the four corners. So one of the four fountains is in the corner of the church and then um, the others are uh, across the streets. So this was done over a period of time with the uh, facade being added later, but we won't go into that. We'll just look at this um, facade and then the dome. So we have a two-story facade. Well, we've seen that before. Starts being hinted at in mannerism. He does not use a uh, uh, Michelangelo's giant order to tie it together. And then we see a broken pediment, a medallion in the middle, and we drop a little temple in here. So these are things that just, you know, you, you just wouldn't do in the Renaissance. Uh, Palladio would never do this. But, uh, and um, Borromini gets criticized for being out of control, being arbitrary. Inside, he has an oval dome. Now, you can very quickly see this is not an ellipse, it's an oval. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter. Um, they're somewhat similar. But, uh, so we have our side domes supporting it, our oval dome, and you see his original drawing and a diagram of it. And the dome is then filled with coffers, which have the job of how do you put together, um, how do you make hexagons and octagons join? And the answer is you alternate them with crosses. Uh, so there's very rich geometry and handling how all this can get smaller as it go and work on a curve as it goes up into the dome. So very rich, dynamic geometry. And finally, on the right is Petra, a Roman city in Jordan. Um, anybody, any Israelis here? <laughs> no. My, uh, we used to have lots of Israeli students, and uh, the ones who were in the military, it's sort of a challenge to, you know, to sneak into Jordan and go see Petra <laughs> and not get caught, just to show that you're that good at bypassing security and getting in there. So uh, 
Petra is carved out of the cliffs. This is not put together in stones, but carved out of the face of the cliff. And it's a series of, of, um, of buildings in this kind of fortified canyon. And we see here the two stories, the two stories, and the little temple dropped in in the middle of a broken pediment. So despite being accused of being arbitrary and capricious, Bernini is following ancient precedents, but different ones.